Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Monika Pessler, and I have to start this video with an apology. Due to technical difficulties, my introduction, as well as the first sentences of Esther Freud's initial statement, are not audible. We are really sorry for this inconvenience. And I will now repeat my introduction and also quote Esther's first statement before the recording of our talk commences. It was a very great honor to welcome the author Esther Freud and the author and lawyer Philip Sands at Bacchus in 19 and to join their dialogue about history, family, silence. Esther Freud is the author of nine novels that have been translated into 15 languages and the first of which Hideous Kinky in German Marrakesh was made into a film starring Kate Winslet. She has written a, normal, a lot of plays, short stories and articles and in 2019 was made a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. I Couldn't Love You More, her recent book was published this year in May. Philip Sands is professor of law at University College London and a barista at Matrix Chambers. His latest books are East West Street, Brücke nach Lemberg in German and The Rat's Line, Die Rattenlinie, in which Vienna and his family origins feature. He's president of English Pen and a member of the board of the Hay Festival of Arts and literature. And since the professional involvement of both is closely related to the family history and personal life experiences, let me very briefly mention some more of their biographical dates. Esther was born in London, 1933, the second daughter of Bernadine Coverley and Lucian Freud. Her mother was a teacher, traveler, and writer and came from an Irish Catholic family. Her father, one of the most famous and influential painters in England, was a grandson of Martha and Sigmund Freud, the son of Esther and Lucy, who emigrated to London 1933, where Ernst worked as an architect of the international style. And after Sigmund Freud escaped the Nazi terror, in 1938, they published his writings. So Esther is great, Freud's great granddaughter. Philip Sands was born in London 1960 to Ruth Buchholz and Ellen Sands. His grandfather Leon managed to escape in 1938 after the Anschluss of Austria. Philip Sands, Viennese great grandmother, Amalia Buchholz, was a victim of the Holocaust in Treblinka in 1942 and shares the fate with Freud's sisters, Rosa, Mizi, Tolfi, and Paula. Sand's book East West Street on the origin of genocide and crimes against humanity has been translated into 20 languages. It was the basis for the documentary, My Nazi Legacy, what our fathers did from 2015 that won the Yad Vashem Chairman's Award at the Jerusalem Film Festival. Sands explores in his book on one hand the life story of his grandfather, Leon Puchholz, who was born in Lviv and his grandmother, Rita. And on the other hand, the careers of the lawyers, Herr Schlauterbach and Raphael Lemkin, who began their university careers at the university in Lviv, former Lemberg, today Livio, where Leon Buchholz also grew up. As advisors of the British and the Americans at the Nuremberger trials, Lauterbach and Lemkin formulated for the very first time the criminal law elements of crimes against humanity and genocide which subsequently found their way into the Human Rights Convention of 1948 and 
the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So Sand's narrative is, of course, closely interwoven with the Nazi crimes given by Hans Frank, Governor General in occupied Poland, and Otto Wächter, Governor of Krakow in Poland and Galicia in Ukraine. And in a very close, intimate dialogue with their sons, Niklas Frank and Horst von Wächter, Philip Sands develops a multifaceted account of the historical events that brings the aftermath to light. As the Freud mentioned two novels, Summer at Gaglov and The Sea House, that are inspired by her family history also, and especially by the refugee experience that impacted her family when they settled in England. In Summer at Gaglov, it is the longing of the young pregnant woman, Sarah, who sits as a model for her father, who is a painter, and in search of her own roots, she tries to learn more about his childhood and where he comes from. And in the sea house, it's the student Lily who researches the life of the architect Klaus Lehmann, who came to England as an emigre in 1930s. And in a house by the sea in Steerboro, she's dealing with his fight, fate of flight, with his first decades living in exile and with his long past love story too. And she starts to compare this with her own. Concerning the influence of the past on their mind and writings, my first question to Esther and Sands was as following. Is the fact that Esther's books are looking for a home, a home both physical and psychological, is that something you both share with each other? And Esther Freud answered first, I'm very curious to hear how Philip feels about this. I have the wonderful luxury of being a writer. I get to discover what interests me and you get to discover what is you want to write about. I always think I don't know what I'm writing until I'm writing it, or even what I'm thinking until my fingers are typing. My first novel I wanted to call A Home for Us. I sent it to some agents. They said, no, thank you. So I changed the title to Hideous Kinky. And the agent said, yes, please send it straight away. So I could see that my kind of slightly mm. um, poignant sentimentality mm. wasn't really hitting very hard um, with other people's experience at that moment. But inside that story, was the search for a home. And I always put it down to the idea that, um, because I had a very peripatetic childhood with my mother, who was single mother, she was a teenage mother, um, and we moved, once we moved 16 times in two years. And we moved and moved because we didn't have anywhere to be. Um, and that's really a story of, of um, the times, poverty, the lack of the sort of you know, what happens when somebody, a woman breaks free of the conventional life. And um, I really deal with this in a way in my most recent book with, you know, there, there are her, my mother's Catholic parents, absolutely horrified by her behavior, but understandably, in some ways, they're fearful for her. Um, so I had a great longing for a home. I still am um, absolutely I have a, a mixture in me of longing to travel, a great restlessness, but also wanting a really large, grand, ideally white house, you know, something very beautiful. And so I kind of go between these two great desires. But when I was here, we, we were lucky enough to spend the afternoon here and Monica was showing us around and I suddenly thought for the first time how the other side of my family was, was homeless and had to completely transfer their base of home, both my, obviously my, great grandfather from Vienna, but my grandfather and father from Berlin, where they were living, and that they started again. And that for me, as the inheritor of that, 
um, there was a silence, which comes into the silence of the title. Someone said, oh, I understand about history and uh, memory, but what do you say about silence? I said, silence, that's the thing we have mo most to say about, because there was a silence for me in my family, in my history. My mother didn't talk much about her family because they disapproved of her so thoroughly. And she kept a secret, in fact, for many years. My father never mentioned anything about his family at all, to the point when the first time I ever even heard someone ask me, are you Jewish, was when I was in Germany as a 13-year-old on a school exchange. So uh, no one had asked me that question ever. But I thought, I guess I, I, guess I am. And I said yes, and waited to see what would happen. And I, I was greeted with immense kindness. Um, but it, it showed me what, um, how much silence there'd been in my life, and, and to this day, so much silence. So a very long answer to this now, Philippe. <laughs> I'd be curious to hear what you say. Well, I think it's first, it's incredibly nice to be here, and we've been treated so beautifully today. So I think, I'm, I think we both feel like you've heard it from Esther, a real sense of welcome. I think you need to understand also that Esther and I are friends, but we're only recent friends. So our paths really are completely different and somehow at a later stage in life we've both connected we have very different lives she has followed a particular path she has parents who are very different in their style from my parents my parents were middle class my father a dentist in incredibly secure childhood um, and a mother who had got married absurdly young at the age of 17 or 18, basically to move away from a life in France that wasn't to her liking. And she chose, which is interesting, having been born in Vienna in July 1938, not a good time to be born if you're Jewish, moves a year later, spends the wartime years of Nazi-occupied France as a hidden child and doesn't get to know her parents until she's about five years old. And then a dozen years later, leaves. So these were obviously hugely important factors in my childhood growing up. I had a French grandfather and a French grandmother. They sort of would speak in German when we went to visit them in Paris, my brother and I, when they didn't want us to understand what they were talking about. But like Esther, no one ever talked about what happened in the past. So my brother and I grew up in a world of silence. We knew things had happened, but we knew you did not talk about these issues. And so we didn't, it was a self-imposed censorship. I, I suspect I, I'm, you didn't know, whereas I knew, but I knew not to ask about it. And for various reasons that I'm sure are connected to elements of that past, I chose the path of law and international law and human rights and have been very fortunate in the life that I've had. But it was only in 2010 when I received an invitation to give a lecture in the city of Lemberg, Lviv, Lvov, on the cases that I do on crimes against humanity and genocide that I accepted, really not because I wanted to give a lecture, because I wanted to find the house where my grandfather was born. And that was an issue of identity, breaking the silence. Knowing who my grandfather was and in knowing who my grandfather was, knowing who I was. So obviously, once you open the door to Lemberg, Lviv, you then make the journey to Vienna. And very slowly, I began to piece together what had happened. But it's only in the last six or seven years that I've come to know the full story. So for both of us in different ways, writing in different ways, you fiction, me nonfiction, the thrust of our writing in a sense is connected, I think, to matters of, for me, uh, matters of identity. And silence is the antithesis of identity, or at least it's the antithesis of understanding true or truer 
identity and knowing who you are. So I think we're bonded in this way unexpectedly. I mean, I think it's so true. And there's one thing you said that made me think that with my first two novels, my first one, as I've said, was, was, was very much based in my Moroccan childhood. Then I wrote another novel that was an autobiographical in the same kind of way. But with my third novel, I, I, it, it, this was what is now called Summer at Gaglo. It used to just be Gaglo. But um, my father, who spoke almost never about the past, very occasionally would just say something small. And I would jump on it and try and ease it out and try and encourage him. But he, I had to be very sort of um, subtle because he hated a direct question. You had to sort of find a strange way. So I collected a few stories. And he used to talk about his, his mother, mother, his grandmother, who was rather grand, lived in a house called Gaglo somewhere outside Berlin. And she had horses and stables. One time there was a fire and the horses were let free. And, and he talked about how his his um, mother and her sisters didn't like their mother. And I was quite intrigued by his mother, who I didn't know. And um, I, the idea of her intrigued me, um, partly because I look very like her. So I, I was sort of, and what I'm really saying is that I started to ease out stories and begin a novel because it was a way of belonging. And because I didn't feel I really belonged to either of my parents' families in any way, I needed to find a way to belong. And I did that through fiction. And this, this novel was the hardest thing I have ever written because it was set in, in Berlin and the outskirts of Berlin in 1914, before the internet, I used to traipse around to sort of German institutes in London and see if I could find memoirs of young men who fought in the, in the First World War and find memoirs of all sorts of descriptions. And then I'd have them translated. And it was absolutely backbreaking work and I didn't really know what I was doing you described that there's a section in the book where the young woman is sitting uh, modeling for her artist father after four years of work I suddenly had that idea and I wrote that in about six weeks 100 pages just and I put it all in and I thought now the book makes sense because I didn't know why I was writing this very particular story I needed to bring it into the sort of present but um when that book was published, and we've been talking about this, mm -hmm. chatting so much all day and yesterday about what books, books give birth to books. So I published this book. My father was absolutely staggered. And I felt that he, we grew closer. And as a result, he said, I have something for you. And when he said that, I knew it was something he meant for you to use. And he gave me a huge carrier bag of letters that his father had written to his mother through their whole marriage. And he wanted me to use that in some way. And I started to write the other book, uh, The Sea House, which is also very much caught up. But that wasn't the only thing. I had, I had found a, 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 a book that I'd had translated, um, written by a man um, called Richard Sampson. And he was an extraordinary story of sort of daring and bravery. And the granddaughter of this man told her father, I think that that's your father. I think that there's these, I think this story, and at the back I'd acknowledged him. And then I had this wonderful correspondence for years with a man called Otto Sampson, who sent me his memoirs. So I got, I, having promised I would never write another novel that I knew nothing about. I wrote The Sea House with ha without having to go to a single library. I had, it's like everything landed on my lap because I had put myself at the center in a way of my life. I felt I belonged in a way I never did before. So it's not just houses, it's more a strange kind of almost uh, invisible feeling of being kind of the rightful inheritor of your family history, which, which is hard to do when no one has spoken of it. It's a very parallel process. It's uncanny how similar um, the stories are. So we've spent two days wandering around Vienna, which is really an interesting experience. I have to say, it's been a sort of an amazing couple of days. Um, I don't think either of us knew what to expect from this visit. Both of us are the kind of people that you don't, you basically don't do any preparation until this is an English barrister style. You turn up, you arrive, oh, it's, you know, Sunday, I'm in Vienna, right, what's on? And then you begin. But what we've uncovered over these 36 hours is amazing point of connection. And you've just raised another one that I've only heard about now which is the presentation of a vast number of documents all of a sudden. I mean, 
the, it's very interesting. The two of us grew up in households. Again, I only learned this today, where the parent who emerged from these terrible experiences both imposed upon their successors nothing German in the house. Okay, so that, that was what I grew up with. There will be nothing German in the house. We will not have a German car. We will not have a German fridge. We will not have a German cooker. You won't read any German books. You know. And of course, you know, very soon you get to your teenage years and your 20s and German things start to come into your life and actually German things sort of seem okay. And now you end up driving a German car and you've got a German cooker and you've moved, you've moved on. But how curious that we have that common experience and we've both ended up for reasons that we have not explored, going back to documents from that and later periods to unearth things which I think must be intended to ground us and give us a sense of security. So the bundle of documents issue has arisen on two occasions for me, both East West Street and the Rat Line. I mean, I've written a lot of academic books, which I'm very proud of and sell nine and a half copies. And I would do exactly the same thing again, but all of a sudden you enter a new world when you're writing books for a much larger audience. West Street would not have been written, but for two bags of letters, documents, Nazi passports, yellow stars and other things that my mother brought into her living room in the summer of 2010, that at the age of 50, I had never seen before. It's pretty amazing. And but for a birth certificate of my grandfather showing he'd been born on Sheptitsky Street in Lemberg in May 1904, I would never have been able to write the books that I wrote, East West Street. And of course, exactly as Esther says, one thing leads to another. You open a door and then you're in a space and there are three more doors and you go through one of those doors and then there are three more doors and it just <laughs> becomes absolutely endless through the process of research of East West, what became East West Street, because I didn't realize I was writing a book, I get to meet and befriend a man called Nicholas Frank, who is the son of Hans Frank, who happens to be the man hanged for the murder of four million human beings, three million Jews and a million Poles, including my grandfather's entire family from Lemberg. And yet he's now my friend. So that's pretty weird and interesting, and I think a good thing. And at a certain point, Nick says to me, Ah, Lemberg. You're interested in Lemberg. Lemberg's where you're, you know, well, my, gra my grandmother was actually born in Vienna here, uh, but my grandfather in Lemberg. And you're interested in Lemberg. You must want to know about Otto Wächter. Otto Wächter was the gouverneur of District Galicia, first of Krakow, then of District Galicia. And um, would you like to meet his son, Horst, who lives in Hagenberg in Austria? I said, well, I'd love to. I'm not sure why he'd want to meet me, but sure, let's do it. And I got to meet Hor. Some of you tomorrow will hear the story of that in a little more detail. And one thing led to another. I wrote a profile of Horst in the Financial Times, which caused a bit of mayhem in certain parts of the upper echelons of the Austrian society, shall we say. Um, uh, and... And because it turned out that one of the Wächter grandchildren um, was a partner in a law firm with offices in New York with many Jewish partners, and the light having been shone on Otto Wächter senior, senior at this unfortunate moment would have the most terrible consequences for the grandson, which was nonsense, of course. But we got over that and we ended up making this film. And at a certain moment in the making of the film, Horst, dear Horst, said, oh, well, we must go to Lemberg and we must go and watch the reincarnation of the famous Battle of Bohody, where my father's Waffen-SS Galicia division were routed by the Soviets, but they're good people, let's go and see them. And we went and it was a truly appalling day, seeing hundreds of people wandering around the hills, dressed proudly in Waffen-SS uniforms is not something you feel entirely comfortable about, but we went and we did it. Nicholas came also. And Nicholas was appalled, appalled. The next day we were back in Nemberg, Lviv, and I interviewed Nicholas on camera. And Nicholas said, I think he's a new Nazi. 
And I said, no, no, I don't think he is. I, I think he's just a damaged person who, who, who is trying to find the good in his parents somehow and is misguided. No, no, Nicholas said he's a, he's, a, he's a Nazi. I think he's a Nazi. I disagree with that. And um, the upshot of that was that when Horst saw the offcuts from the film, he asked a very interesting question. He said, how can I prove I'm not a Nazi? It, you know, in court and in life, proving a negative is not so easy. I came up with the idea that he had this archive, 10,000 pages of family documents, incredible diaries, letters, the love of Charlotte and of Otto over 20 years, from 29 to 49. Why didn't you give them to a museum? Nazis don't give these kinds of documents to museums. She says, that's a fantastic idea. He gives it all to the museum, says, do you want a USB? And I say, yeah, sure. A USB comes through and it's unbelievable material. You've got the total family life that no one wants to talk about from those communities. What happened? How they went up the Greece. And they're not just anybody. This is the guy who killed Dolphus. This is the guy who came back and stood on the Heldenplatz two meters from Adolf Hitler. Finally, I found that photograph just four weeks ago because that photograph has disappeared. Um, and that enabled me to write the rat line. So the search for documents and what it throws up. But the question is, why were we so interested in those documents? Do you think there's someone in each family that is the searcher and the storyteller? Because I don't, I'm in my family and I have a lot of cousins and, and siblings. I'm the one who has taken this on and has become interested. And if anyone wants to know anything about the family and even towards the end of his life, my father, he'd say, when was my mother born? Or <laughs> uh, what, were, what were they called, my aunts? Or, you know, he, he, everyone comes to me and says, did, did we lose anyone? And yeah, did, can you remember this? Or it, it's, it seems to have become my job. And I know you don't have such a large family as I do, but is your brother interested in any of this? Like, why did it fall to you? And why did it fall to me? I don't really know. My brother is interested in it, very interested in it, but, but, but he's not the actor like you are or, or I am. And I think different people in families have different functions and they work in different ways. He's been, he's been hugely supportive. Um, I, I want to come back to this question of how stories emerge and find another point of connection. And I'm going to mention this because the person concerned, I think, may be watching uh, our conversation now because of COVID. I know we're a small audience, but there are others who are watching. And this is a rather wonderful person that I came to know two years ago. I was teaching um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, and in, uh, teaching a law course. And one of my friends there said, um, you probably get this kind of thing also, my mother's got a friend who read your book and loved it and would love to meet you. Okay, And of course, wonderful to meet elderly readers, but you know, they're limited hours in the day and um, days in the week and so on and so forth. If I went and met every friend's mother who loved reading a book, I would... <laughs> Cease work. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, my friend, actually, I think you might want to meet this lady. And I said, why would I want to meet this lady? And he said, because she's Sigmund Freud's granddaughter. Since we're in the Freud Museum, it's uh, of interest. Her name is Sophie Freud. And because of the Freud name, because of my own Viennese heritage, of course, immediately, yeah, yeah, I want to meet that person. And so I go off and meet Sophie Freud, who's in great shape in her mid-90s, um, living just outside Cambridge, Massachusetts, and engage in a simply marvelous conversation. Point Again, points of commonality. And report all of this back um, to Esther, Life is strange. Why was it that I came to know Esther? How could it be that of the millions or hundreds of thousands of people who live in 
London or that part of the United Kingdom, that we end up connecting in some way and finding we've got these points of connections. So is it pure coincidence or is it something else? Different people, reasonable people have different views about that. I happen to think it's not a coincidence. I think that we have, as the psychoanalysts Maria Torok and Nicholas Abraham have explored, ways of communicating that we do not fully understand. And we are connected to other kinds of people with whom we communicate, that we, I think, have a form of communication that we don't understand, that allows us to connect in these ways. But my wife, on the other hand, says it's all nonsense, it's total coincidence, <laughs> there's no other form of communication. So how did we end up sitting here in Vienna with these extraordinary points of connection? Well, even though we've known each other for three or four years now, I hadn't realized until I was reading East West Street, which I was just even though I've been meaning to read it, I read the rat line, I was just reading in this last week because I wanted to read it, you know, so that we had this conversation that would enrich this conversation. And it was only reading it that I realized that my great, great aunts, Sigmund's sisters were possibly on the same train as your great grandmother being taken to uh, Treblinka and being put into the death camps in exactly the same way that we had that, that we our, our sort of history went like this and met at exactly the same point. And I don't think I'd have ever realized that if we weren't doing this talk, because, because this, we hold so much in our heads and our hearts that to make those kind of connections, it's almost overwhelming to do so. And we, we tend to try and live in the present much more than that. And it makes me understand in a way why my father never spoke at all, because he, he lived completely in the present. He was determined to live in the present. And that's where he got all his energy. He saved it for himself and he didn't squander it on, on any sort of sadness or trauma. He was absolutely made a decision, I think. And so I, in some ways, I think it's amazing we didn't meet before rather than it's amazing we met. And um, amazing, I didn't make those connections before. Um, but it's, it's a matter of self-preservation, I think. Why, why don't I read that extract? Mm. Because, and just explain a little bit how I go about writing. Because I think a lot, I think my writing and the style of writing and the substance is very much informed by my life as a lawyer. I, I mean, a lawyer who has himself been in, anal in analysis, and so has an understanding of these kinds of concepts and considerations and a great interest um, in those matters. But I'm completely fascinated by tiny points of detail. And I'm, I leave no stone unturned in doing my research. I mean, one of the things that I've loved about the revamp of the museum here is these completely tiny points of detail as you go around, the crack in one of the tiny window panes that explains why there isn't a coat hook in a particular part of the entrance hall to Sigmund Freud's uh, offices. Um, and so I will literally go through the entire transcript of the Nuremberg trial, the famous Nuremberg trial. I'll read every single page because I will know that buried in it is some tiny point of detail. And I do that, and I come across the following. Over the next month, the trial moved from matters of general evidence to individual accounts as witnesses appeared to offer personal first-hand testimony. One such witness was Samuel Reisman, a Polish-speaking accountant, a lone survivor from Treblinka. I found Reisman's account to be especially compelling and personal because Treblinka was where Malka, my great grandmother, Flashner, was murdered. Leon, my grandfather, learned of the details only at the end of his life when my mother showed him a book that contained a long list of the names of those detained at Theresienstadt. Among the thousands of names, 
was the name of Marke Buchholz, with the detail that she was transported from Theresienstadt to Treblinka on the 23rd of September, 1942. Leon retired to the privacy of his room along with the volume where my mother heard him weep. The next day, he said nothing more about the book. Of Treblinka, he never spoke, not in my presence. Samuel Reisman appeared in the witness box on the morning of the 27th of February, 1946, introduced to the judges as a man who had returned from the other world. He wore a dark suit and tie, peered through spectacles. His angular lined face offered a sense of astonishment and bemusement that he was alive, seated just a few feet from Hans Frank, in whose territory Treblinka was located. To look at the man, one would not have known the path he traveled or the horrors he witnessed. He spoke in a measured and calm voice of the journey from the Warsaw Ghetto in August 1942, transportation by rail in inhumane conditions, 8,000 people in overcrowded cattle cars. He was the only survivor. When the Russian prosecutor asked about the moment of arrival, Reisman told him that they were made to undress and walk along Himmelfahrtstrasse, the street to heaven, a short walk to the gas chamber, when suddenly a friend from Warsaw singled him out and led him away. The Germans needed an interpreter. But before that, he loaded the clothes of the dead onto empty trains that departed Treblinka. Two days passed, and then a transport arrived from the small town of Vinegrova, bringing his mother, sister, and brothers. He watched them walk to the gas chambers, unable to intervene. Several days later, he was handed his wife's papers with a photograph of his wife and child. That is all I have left of my family, he said in the courtroom, a public act of revelation, a photograph. He offered a graphic account of killing on an industrial scale, individual acts of horror and inhumanity. The defendants listened in silence, two rows of shamed faces. Reisman talked of conditions at the camp, of the felt fake railway station. The deputy commander Kurt Franz built a first-class railroad station with false signs. Later, an imaginary restaurant was added and scheduled were listed with times of departure and arrival. Grodno, Suwalki, Vienna, Berlin. It was like a film set. To calm people, Reisman explained, so there should not be any incidents. The purpose was psychological, to offer reassurance as the end approached, he was asked. Yes. Reisman's voice remained calm, flat. How many were exterminated each day? Between 10 and 12,000. How was it done? Initially by three gas chambers, then 10 more. Reisman described how he was on the platform when Sigmund Freud's three sisters arrived. He said it was the 23rd of September, 1942. He saw Commander Kurt Franz deal with one of the sisters, Pauline's request for special treatment because she was the sister of Sigmund Freud. After reading the transcript of the trial with the details of the arrival of the Freud sisters from Theresienstadt, I searched for the details of the transport on which the Freud sisters arrived. When I found them, I looked at the other names on the list, a thousand names. And eventually I found the name of Malka Buchholz, my great grandmother. Reisman was on the platform also when she arrived. So of course, when I wrote that, I, I probably hadn't even met you yet. And here we are sitting in Sigmund Freud's house with this extraordinary connection, thanks to the fact that the Germans were immaculate record keepers. And we know that your great aunts and my great grandmother traveled on the very same train and perished in the very same gas chamber. That strikes me as completely remarkable. So what also came to my mind, if you uh, speak about the way um, about how you get to your information and your desire to find out details, 
that make it possible to write about something and also to transport a feeling or the knowledge what happened so that is something um, that gives you safetyness and an identity with all this hard things too and you said that you are your books and fictions are so full of details but they are fiction and i wonder if uh this like we said when we did a museum you have to envision in order to see you have to envision in order to know so there are two possibilities the one is in the free association that you have a fiction of details how they might have been and they represent also a kind of truth like what you found in a document do you know what i mean so it's a construction that helps you one is the research on detail and the other is the <laughs> envisioning of details uh, to construct your past. I think that in a way the, the definition of fiction and non-fiction is so blurred because the minute that you start to tell a story, whether it is classed as non-fiction or fiction, you are doing everything in your power to bring it to life. And East West Street is a non-fiction, but Philippe is a, is, a, is a marvelous storyteller and he brings everything alive. And I feel very strongly when I'm writing that I need to feel that somehow I can own this story. And so if, if, um, if it's a story that I think is a wonderful story, but somehow I can't find any connection to it, I have to let it go. I think someone else's story, but I often keep the story alive in hoping that I'll find a way through to it. And then sometimes you do find a way, you find a really surprising way through the detail and you think, oh, I could tell that story because this will make me feel that it is my story in some way. And, and, and even though there's so many incredible parts in Philippe's books, but it's the personal parts that I yeah. feel uh, most easily to connect with. Mm -hmm. And, um, but through the personal parts of the story, I then connect with all the other bigger more loyally stories, the stories of the way the, 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 these phrases genocide and crimes against humanity were, were brought into our language. I, I had assumed they were always in our language. I didn't realize how recent those were, but I don't think I would have read a book that was, was just without your personal story, because for me, it's like a train that you can jump on. And when I'm writing, I'm the same. I need to, I need to um, somehow jump aboard and feel like it, it is my story to tell in some way and I'm always looking for that all the time you know writers are always looking for a story and uh, seeing it and, and and what's wonderful I'm sure there are many writers in this room is the more you write the more stories appear that they actually sort of breed themselves and when I wrote my first book I didn't like you think I was writing a book I thought I was doing something until until someone said don't do that anymore and I was free not to but but then um when I finished it I had this extraordinary energy and it's almost like I'm blocking a story that's been in you and then you're free to write another story and I remember bumping into somebody who I used to know as a child and she said oh I hear you wrote a book and I said yes, yes. what are you doing now I said I'm writing another one she went, another one <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I know what you mean another one but you know 30 years later I'm still writing and before you spoke about uh, uh, your responsibility and the family that you are the one who did all the research and knows about the ounce and uh, everything and you are doing your research and i think the very touching thing is that you not only write your story you if it's fiction or non-fiction so the, your books are so incredible touching because it's our old story you write down and we have to um deal with so, and they are a little bit uh, uh, of distant uh, writing styles sometimes, what is not a surprise uh, uh, concerning uh, the writing style of a lawyer. Uh, 
And I also had the feeling reading your books that the stories that you tell about the people uh, from the past, um, they had to uh, flee the Nazi terror and so on, that you are a little bit more distant uh, with describing their feelings and the opposite to the feelings you describe from people in our um, age. But um, so it's a very, on the one hand, a very respectful, but on the other hand, a very emotional um, approach. And that makes it easy at reader to be connected with. Also in your book, it's a very emotional book. And you speak about the friendship to Niklas Frank and the whatever ship to uh, Horst Wächter. And, and it's a very emotional and... Uh, well, it may be for you a very emotional book, but there isn't any emotion in the book because I've purposely stripped out all my own emotions. At no point in the book do I disclose my own emotions. And that is because I'm a lawyer. Actually, the style of writing, I have to say, is drawn from a great Austrian writer who did both fiction and nonfiction, and that's Stefan Zweig. I love the way one of my favorite books is The World of Yesterday, in which in a very large sense, emotion is stripped out. I was really amazed actually walking this morning from our hotel into town, suddenly there was a sign on the wall and it said, this was Stefan Zweig's high school. Yeah. And it was very, very, just around the corner. It's incredible, I just felt, felt so emotional and connected. But as you say, Monica, for me, it's very difficult to write about personal things because for 30 years of my life, I've been told in the classroom and in courts, keep your own personal stories and views and opinions and emotions out of it. Stick to the law, stick to the facts. And so various editors over time have had to encourage me to go further and further. And it's why East West Street took five years to write because I found it very, very difficult to do that. I found it difficult to do that because of my life training in the legal world. Although I think it also helped me because it helped me engage with people without getting angry with them, without shouting at them, without weeping, because I've been to see a lot of mass graves and I've seen a lot of horrible things in my life. And so that has made me realize you get information out of people by dealing with them respectfully, courteously, listening, and not imposing your anger and upset on them when you're engaging in conversations. But the family aspect, which Esther touches on, is very, very delicate. What is the responsibility of a writer when she or he or they are dealing with personal stories? And those of you who've read East West Street will know that I confronted personal stories that were immensely sensitive. The question of the paternity of my mother, the discovery that my grandmother, it appears, had chosen to remain in Vienna after her husband had left and after her one-year-old daughter had left ostensibly to look after her mother, but it turned out because she had a lover, another Viennese fellow called Emil Lindenfeld. And when I tracked down Emil Lindenfeld's granddaughter and, um, and she said to me, let's do a DNA test. And I thought about that for a few months because I think that one should be honest if I'm going to do that. I, I'm going to have to write up the answer. And what right do I have as a son to impose on my mother information that could have enormous consequences? I, I have to think about this very, very carefully. So in the end, we agreed to do a DNA test. I got all the DNA things, which, you know, it's like a COVID test. You put Q-tips in your ears and mouths and all sorts of things and send it off to some lab. Lindenfeld's granddaughter emailed me to say, it arrived, I did it within 10 minutes. In my case, it arrived and for six months I didn't do it because I, I had to work out what I would write about in terms of 
of of the response and you talk to a lot of people to test the issue what do i do i who have wanted to find the truth i who am concerned about my own identity am now confronted with something that is potentially monumentally catastrophic for someone who is incredibly dear to me my mother how can i possibly contemplate imposing that upon her and it was a similar issue in relation you know to my grandfather and his friendship with his viennese friend max kupferman you know who i'd heard about what was this friendship really about and i think i've done it honestly in the book and that's my responsibility but i've done it also sensitively and i just wonder whether you in the fiction world face these challenges i'm just just in asking that question as you're thinking through the answer i've just read the utterly extraordinary first biography in english of the great writer wg sebald who is the bridge if you like between us between fiction and non-fiction and it is astonishing he took his stories from real life he took documents from real life and reproduced them verbatim in his novels and people who were in his novels and people who gave him documents that then turned up in his novels of course raised fundamental questions so i think the responsibility is there also in it, it's i mean it's why i write fiction and not <laughs> non-fiction and it doesn't save you unfortunately from upset and i seem to have inhabited a very strange place in my family that i'm have always been a peacekeeper and the one who gets on with everyone and at the same time very quietly has managed to create absolute storms but like oh but not with me because we all get on so you know there's been other members of the family been much more rebellious and um sort of outspoken but then quietly i'll slip something into a book something that can't really be spoken and um and sometimes i get away with it and sometimes i don't and each time i have to say i find it incredibly painful and how much reflection is there on those occasions and how do you go about the process of reflection shall i do this shall i add this little detail will 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 x know that i'm writing about them what's the process and do you consult others i mean how do you or is it a purely internalized thing it's a huge process i keep it to myself i ne i've learned never ask the question when no might be the answer because you don't don't ask a question if there's only one answer you want to hear best not to ask and um i'm writing a short story at the moment and there's a, something in it i i i knew i would never use in fiction and I tried not to and then I thought I'll just try it with that. Oh my <laughs> god, it's so much better. They say, you know, the shard of glass in the heart of every writer. Well, it's so strong. I'm such a nice person, but there's a little bit of ruthlessness in there that <laughs> means for the sake yeah, yeah. of the story, I'll just try it and then I think well I'll change the hair color, maybe I'll <laughs> change this, maybe they won't recognize, maybe they won't mind. Maybe I'll make them really beautiful. try that that can actually work quite well people are like <laughs> blindsided by flattery and but then i fallen down by getting away with it and then writing a piece to publicize my book mm. where i say something to link people's the truth of my life to the story which i don't think sebald ever did or some writers never do and i always think oh that's much mm. cleverer and then i'll get a bar out of upsetness because people don't complain about fiction so much mm. so i've 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 definitely suffered but i i mostly kept on good relations with everyone in my life i just have a, one or two people who are still bruised a little and i'm hoping the next thing that maybe i'll i what, i teach creative writing and i see so mm. many writers who are completely stopped from writing by there are two things that stop people writing the, the biggest one is what will my mother say and the second one is just sheer discipline it takes so much and i just say don't mm. worry about what your mother say write it write it it may never be published that's what i always tell myself <laughs> or maybe maybe she went mind or maybe you could change her so she's unrecognizable or just write it don't not write it please if you don't write it it stays inside 
writing is unbelievably satisfying and it isn't therapy but it is very therapeutic mm. so i would just please don't not write it and so i also say the same thing to myself and i think oh, i'm so ruthless i'm shocked but then maybe i'll tone it down or find some other way i sometimes ask my sister it's never good no i'm yeah i'm just i just try and get from year to year without too much trouble Thank you very much. I think it's time to ask the audience sure. if they have questions sure, and want to make yeah. a statement, if that's okay yeah. for you. Of course. So okay, I would like to invite you to ask your questions or maybe to give a comment or to ask Esther or Philip Sand something about his book. Thomas? Oh, poor Thomas was chosen like that for someone at school. Oh. It's the Socratic method. <laughs> okay. Yes, um, first of all, it's wonderful to listen to the two of you, which is so different, but at the same time, maybe very much mm -hmm. the same. And um, uh, the reason, the main reason for me to be here is because when I read your book, of course, it was very close to me because both my parents are from Lemberg. And reading it, you know, gave me, I mean, it's, it was like, you know, Christmas, Hanukkah, Pesach and Easter together, because all of a sudden there was a guy who did what I didn't do, go there and find out and, and, you know, see where, you know, his origins are coming from. And of course, when I grew up here in Vienna, I was born here, my parents um, survived. They were in Lemberg when it was still the wolf. And then they were in a camp and then they, they managed to escape with false papers. And they came to Vienna to uh, actually go to Israel, then Palestine. But then they never did, so I was born here. And I was born in a sort of semi-ghetto in a way because my parents, they only mixed actually with other Jewish people. In fact, there was a group of the Polish and there was a group of the Hungarian and way down were the Romanians, which was sort of looked down. But anyway, I was sort of growing up in this environment and there were hundreds of stories because all my friends, you know, the children of the parents, they had the story like, you know, my, my mother was in this camp and in that camp. And we talked a lot about it. So I was actually... Mm. I don't know whether you call it lucky, but it was a very good thing mm. that my parents talked about it. Mm. And also the children, you know, my friends, you know. So I heard a lot about it and I grew up with it in the middle of the very anti-Semitic Vienna where, you know, you weren't Jewish, you were mosaic, you know, and you had to mention it all the time. On every paper you had to say which mm. religion you are. Mm. So um, growing up here was weird. I was lucky because, you know, I was somehow in an ivory tower in a way. I went to a school which was, you know, very open. I never had very bad experiences, but nevertheless, it was an odd thing. So reading your book and now listening to you and hopefully later on meeting you was a great, for me, a, a real treat. And my dream is maybe one day we all go to Lemberg together, but that, <laughs> that's something else. And you, Esther, is so funny because you are in this combination here, which I said before is odd, because my daughter's favorite book is Hideous Kinky. Oh. So she said to me, tell her, that's mm. what I do. <laughs> anyway, it was lovely that to, to listen to you. Thank you both. Well, I came from Lemberg yesterday, oh, really? and I have good news to announce. You can put in your diary the 8th and 9th of October tentatively, 2022. I have had well, probably 2,000 communications of people who want to go to Lembo. I have not done an event anywhere in the world, and I'm including Bangladesh, South Africa, Mexico, Argentina, where someone doesn't put their hand up and say, actually, my family's from Lembo. Yeah. It, it's, it's insane. So I'm just saying, oh, write me an email, and one day we'll organize a jamboree. And I met with the mayor on Friday night, and he's going to organize a return to Lemberg, Hukia nach Lemberg. 
um, and the date we have tentatively got uh, is then. And I cannot possibly organize such a thing. Um, so I have identified there was an American tour company that had got in touch and asked me if I'd go and give some lectures in Lemberg for 20 people. And I said, no, I won't do it for 20 people, but I'll do it for a thousand people. Mm -hmm. You organize it. And so they're going to organize it. But on a more serious note, but you can mark that diary and just follow me on Twitter and you'll, it'll, on a more serious note, on the matter of silence, because I think you've evoked something that is important and we're in Vienna and let's talk about the elephant in the room, okay? Let's talk about the silence on the other side of the story. Frankly, until I had met Nicholas Frank, it had never occurred to me what happened in the families of the other side of the story. And then Nicholas, who I've come to love, just said, no, we grew up in total silence. You know, no one wanted to talk about what had happened. And then as I uncovered the story of the Wächters here in Vienna, and there are lots of Wächters, and some of you will know the Wächters, um, you will see that there is a similar silence. Possibly the most extraordinary story in that sense was, I wrote a piece about it in the, you'll find it online for the New Yorker magazine, an email I received on Christmas day from a historian here in Vienna, Maria Therese Anbom, who wrote to me to say, your Dihatnenia uh, was given to me as a Christmas gift and I just couldn't wait and I rushed to read it and I was amazed in the early pages to find a reference to my great-grandfather um, Robert Winterstein who was the federal prosecutor the chief prosecutor on the day of the Anschluss and of course was removed from office immediately she said we have the letter that was sent to him by a senior state secretary but we've never been able to decipher the handwriting and the name was not typed out. So for many years, decades, we have not known who was the person who had removed my great grandfather from his position and effectively caused him to be banished, and he was Buchenwald, from which he never re returned. Very distinguished jurist, so that touches me. She said, now with your book, we know it was Otto Wächter you have confirmed that it was Wächter. She said, that's not why I'm writing to you. I'm writing to you because I live in my great grandfather's house. And my next door neighbor and dear friend for many years is a granddaughter of Otto Wächter's. We had not known our points of connection. So that is a very affecting story. And of course, it operates in a society that has not wanted really, frankly, to open the door on what happened. Because what? The same issues or different issues that cause those silences. For silence permeates on all sides. Yes, I was so touched by what you said about growing up with the freedom that everyone was speaking. And I wondered if the, the emigre and Jeff refugee story is what divides. Although I was talking to somebody last week and I was telling them they're a Jewish family and she's married to a Jewish man, in London. And I was saying that we were talking about silence and that we both experienced it so much. And she said, oh, my, my husband's family is very Jewish and they talk about being Jewish the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's just so fascinating that you get in the way one extreme or another and that um once silence is there and imposed it's very hard to break through it and um it can feel as if it's the, the thing that's protecting and there's a safety and i was i was telling telling um monica and philippe earlier that my father as we've already mentioned was he he didn't want he never wanted to go to germany talk about germany speak german um, was quite appalled when, because of the school I went to, I went on this exchange, he, he was amazed, but because he wasn't with my mother, he didn't feel he could interfere. Um, 
But then in, in the 80s, there was an exhibition of his work in Berlin. And it's the first time that Germany had asked to hold a big exhibition of his work. And he said he really thought twice. Um, he said he wouldn't attend it. And they were very disappointed. And they said, well, would somebody? And so he asked if I would like to go. And I was always happy to go anywhere, you know, to have an adventure. And I didn't have the same kind of feelings as he did. And I went. And on that very first night that the exhibition opened, somebody came and took a little painting, a very beautiful painting that he had made of Francis Bacon, his great friend, put it under their coat and left the museum. And it turned out that security was switched off, that the one way screws had not been screwed in. My father was devastated and he felt that it had been a mistake that he should never have allowed any kind of rapprochement of any kind and that in that that painting he was advised almost like uh, you know when a, when someone's kidnapped not to make it public to keep quiet to let the painting come back into circulation mm. so that uh, it's more likely to appear again and he waited for maybe uh, 20 30 years and nothing was ever heard of the painting and then he decided when he was very old he wanted to have this painting back in his life so he ordered enormous posters to be made. They were huge, you know, the size of that door. And they had a picture of Francis Bacon painting and it said wanted. And then it said a huge reward will be given in return for this wanted painting. And they were plastered up all over Berlin and almost all of them within 24 hours were stolen because they were so beautiful. <laughs> they were works of art. And I have one myself framed in my house and the painting has still not been recovered. So um, it's very hard to know the mm. best way to kind of traverse these silences in life, you know, and it is in the end, the personal has to be respected, how each individual person feels that they can bear to sort of, mm. to sort of transverse it somehow. So, yeah. My name is... Ralph Engelman and my father, Edmund Engelman, took some of the photographs that you can see here. And um, I was very struck by, the, again, the discussion of silence. I mean, the taking of that pictures was to, uh, you know, struggle against silence about Sigmund Freud and that history. But at the same time, you know, um, I learned very little, you know, relatively little about my father and so especially my mother in terms of her past. And this notion of living in the present, trying to repress the past, you know, is something that, of course, it, it doesn't really work. It, but it's what, to a certain extent, my parents tried to do. And especially, it's very, I think, being in America, it's it's this notion of reinventing yourself or whatever. It's particularly uh, problematic. But it so happens I've just been here for several days uh, visiting with my wife, who's German, and and uh, our relatives. That I've you know retraced many of the uh, places where my father lived and places he went to. It's it's all made it very real to me. And. I very much regret that I'm not able to ask many of the questions that, you know, I would like to ask of him. And, uh, you know, I kind of regret to a certain extent going along with the silence, although mm. I became a historian and, and wrote about, you know, the origins of Nazism. So there was a, you know, uh, uh, a connection there. Um, you know, I only say that my mother, who my father met in here in Vienna, and they, they escaped with great difficulty very late through France, um, that my mother uh, was Polish and she lost her whole family uh, that were in, uh, she was from Łódź, from Lodz and, and the family, um, you know, were, they all left and she was particularly uh, insistent in a way on trying to start fresh and push this history back she lived to be 100 years old. And when she started to lose it, but just started to lose it, suddenly she became, it was all that she would talk about and uh, refer to. 
so the issues that you're talking about in, in your book and, and discussing so beautifully here, I think are, are terribly important and germane. And not just in Germany. I mean, I mean, I mean, all over your real, your really powerful words resonate with me enormously. I'm often asked, what is my greatest regret? And I've come to realize that I have a very simple answer to that and a very clear answer. I knew my grandfather for 37 years. He lived until 1997. And I never asked him the question, because I knew I couldn't, what was your mother like? Can you imagine what it means for him not to be able to talk with his grandson about his mother? And what it means for a grandson not to be able to pose a question that, that all of us ask. And it, it's the most simple of human desires, I think. It comes back really to what else. It's about telling stories. My grandfather would have just said X, Y, or Z. I mean, maybe he would have talked about it. I don't know. I can't believe I never asked him that question. You know, I knew him for so many decades. What happened to exclude me from doing that? And that continues to eat away at me. So the lecture that I'm giving tomorrow, I always like to use images. I mean, a lecture is a sort of form of performance. And I think words are good, but they're often not enough. People need something to focus on. So I choose always a select number of images. And I was telling Esther, I, I'm a little bit stuck. I was stuck. I think I sorted it out. On the last image to leave at the end of the lecture and in particular whether to include an image a photographic image of my grandfather's mother which i have because it would be a way of memorializing her and a way of answering the question that i was never able to ask against that is a danger that weighs heavily on me in the, as I wrote East West Street in the Rat Line, is sent to be accused of sentimentalization, which I don't want to do. I don't, I didn't, I don't want to put this in disrespectful terms, but I didn't want to write another book about the terrible things that happened to the Jews between 1933 and 1945. I wanted to do something else. They were terrible. We all know how terrible they were. I didn't need to write another story of that. And I'm stuck on what to do about my great grandmother. It's really interesting, simple and complex. And it's, I think, completely connected to the point you just made. It's the same thing. So I think that's all the also the quality and the impressive feeling that your book and also the fiction of yours uh, can communicate is the way of that you two are here today and that we are able to speak mm. and to hear what you are doing and the way how you're writing and how you're uh, handling uh, all this past and the search of your identity gives so gives us a lot of um, just, it's a way to look at you and to, sh to look at how you, how you handle that. That is the big issue. Not, not what, how many Jews were murdered and how awful was it, but how you describe it, how you fiction it. So that everybody as a human being, just as a human individual being can, can find itself in the stories and also in the way how to look at it, to look at the bars. And I think that was, was this lady was maybe thought 
how, how you express how to go to Lemberg and how to face it. And to be honest enough to say, or to open enough to say, I never asked this very important question. So that um, hmm. seems to be very important to share that. Is there? Maybe just to, to add what you said, Monica, about the, the very special quality uh, for us as readers of your books. And now I'm talking mostly with you, Philip. Um, it's, we are here at the museum also so much dealing with documents and um, documents from the past. But by reading your book, it's the documents not only speak, they speak back to us. And this is a very um, new experience and creates a new kind of even intersubjectivity between the reader and the knowledge, which is, which is objective and which is clear, but still the documents speak back. I don't know how to, to formulate it differently, but there is a very, a very strong and very special quality in this, in how you succeed in, in making- It's not just representing a fact. Well, it's uh, representing your to, words, uh, show well, what it has well, to mean to us. Since we're in Sigmund Freud's house, let's yeah. cut to what that, what I, 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 I think what you're saying. And I, in a sense, I really don't take credit for it because I stumbled across it by accident. It's the silver lining that comes out of this horror period. The invention of these two terms. One of the huge surprises of writing this book, I was telling Esther, was that I get a lot of invitations to speak to associations of psychiatrists, psychologists, psychoanalysts. Why? Because the book posits the fundamental issue of human existence. Who am I? Am I an individual? Am I a member of a group? How do I want the law to protect me? Because of my innate qualities as a living, breathing human being? or because I happen to be a member of a group that is hated at a particular moment in time and place. And the struggle between Lauterpacht and Lemkin, who are both of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, that's another aspect that is completely fascinating. We discussed before, Lauterpacht studied in Vienna under Hans Kelsen, who was a close friend of Sigmund Freud's, and I am certain that the idea of individual human rights that Lauterpacht invented, you will be able to find the connections through Kelsen to Freud, that the origins of international human rights in some way are connected to conversations that were held in this building. Lauterpacht was here at that very moment from 1919 to 1923, the absolutely crucial moment when Kelsen was drafting the constitution of Austria, the first ever constitution in the world that gave individuals rights to petition a constitutional court and argue that their rights under constitutional law were not being protected. A revolutionary idea, followed 25 years later by Lauterpacht. Lauterpacht focused on the protection of the individual. Lemkin said, no, it's not good enough. People get killed, not because of their individual actions, but because they're a member of a group that is hated at a particular moment in time and place, and the law must reflect that and must protect us by protecting the groups of which we happen to be a member. No, said Lauterpacht, if you go that way, you will replace the tyranny of the state with the tyranny of groups, which actually is, I think, what has happened. And I think we have to put on the table the terrible possibility that the invention of the concept of genocide, the brilliant invention of the concept of genocide by Raphael Lemkin, has actually given rise to the very thing it was intended to prevent, to reinforce the power and autonomy of group identity. And Daniela, in terms of the point that you are making, what I had not realized in writing East West Street is that issue resonates, not just with every single person in this room, but every single human being, because the fundamental question is, who are we and how do we associate with the various groups of which we are members? And the lawyers, to give them credit, Lauterpacht and Lemkin sort of recognized that and dealt with it in an extraordinarily 
simple binary way. It's miraculous to me uh, to have written a book that's essentially about international law and find that there are hundreds of thousands of readers across the world. There aren't hundreds of thousands of international lawyers or psychoanalysts or psychiatrists. And yet that simple, fundamental question touches everyone. And I think that's the heart of East West Street. Mm. And why it's so powerful for me to be here with Esther and with you talking about these issues, because I think Esther has described in her novels that she's essentially dealing, articulated in a different way with the same issues. I think it, for me, it makes complete sense why my father, and I only can really talk about him because he purposefully didn't, he so desperately didn't want to be part of a group that he didn't really have almost anything to do with any of his family in, in, in the years I knew him. And I was, he was a little older when he had me, apart from one cousin who conveniently lived in America, so could only see every few years when she visited. And he didn't want to think of himself as part of a group, especially a group that had been so victimized. And so it, it never came up. And that's how he presented himself as an individual. And he encouraged us never to think of ourselves as even part of the family group, especially not as part of, you know, the descendant of this great person in case we stopped trying to think who we were. And Sigmund Freud in our family never got mentioned apart from as a joke because someone once chased him down the road and said, I think he may have been the Chinese man said, are you, are you a, rela rela a relation of the great fruit? <laughs> and so then he said, oh, the grapefruit. And then that was the only time <laughs> this name got mentioned ever. And I had to find out myself what that really meant, the grapefruit. It took a while. <laughs> and that's how far he was prepared to go. But I think every generation rebelled. So I was keen to be, I was keen to be a member of a group. I wanted to be a member of my family. I actually would have rather enjoyed being a member of um, maybe a little bit more observant Jewish family or even <laughs> a Catholic fruit. family. Basically, I wanted to belong anywhere. I felt like it had been thrown into the air to such an extent that I was so on my own and I burrowed my way back into my family through my own work. Whereas my father, you know, the great desire for everyone to kind of cling together mm. um, from that generation above him. And he just was, no, I, I'm an individual. I'm getting out of here. Mm. So. Yeah, thank you very much. It's very moving. Um, on on the resonance, yeah, I, I, resonance. I just want to mention when I was reading Redline, I got furious, I got appalled, I got horrified, I got disgusted, and as I had a very, I still have a very strong emotional response. And this amazes me because you say it, it is very, you have written it very nüchtern, you know, the German word, yeah, yeah very, yeah, factual, yeah. And, and you didn't want to pass on your own emotions, but in a way you pass them on. And they, I assume you also were disgusted or this in this weird castle of Hagenberg. I only saw a picture in the newspaper and, and, and the uh, photography of this, I think, weird man. I think of, of, of this Horstwächter. Yeah? So I, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah? You, you, you try to keep the emotions out and while reading, they, uh, the, the, the readers are affected or feel the emotions. Yeah? But I also want to add something quite different on, on uh, Lemberg. S some, for the Viennese audience here, some years ago, two or three years ago, there were the, um, the what is it, the, the tapes shown in the film museum of Simon Wiesenthal, where he narrates his biography. So you know probably well, that. No, please say more. I mean, tapes. I... No. And also in, in one of the on, on our first tapes, he described how his mother was lined up in Lemberg and how he tried to get her out and and uh, and and or, or not getting him in and what coincidences happened. Do, do you know about these uh, films that uh, uh, this narr personal narration of uh, uh, Simon Wiesenthal about his biography? 
I've heard about them, but I haven't seen them. I know the episode that you're talking about, and it is a central point of yeah. Horst's uh, conclusion that my book is completely Shrekly, um, <laughs> because he believes that one of the likely murderers of his father, Paws, <laughs> was his father murdered? I really don't think so. But nevertheless, Horst does believe it because it's wonderful to have a father who is a victim, victim. rather than a perpetrator, is Simon Wiesenthal. He blames Simon Wiesenthal personally for having murdered his father with <laughs> not a great deal of evidence that's generous, being generous to him. Um, and his technique is to identify errors, factual errors in Wiesenthal, in that Wiesenthal biography. Ah, but my father was in Krakow on the 15th of August, 1942. He wasn't in Lemberg. So he, he can't possibly, because Wiesenthal says he saw Wächter there at that particular moment. Um, so I'm very aware of it. Um, I mean, I, my own view is at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether the vector was there or not. He, he ran the civilian administration. He was responsible for transports. There's simply no question that if he had been caught, he would have been tried. He would have been convicted. And like Odilo Globochnik and Kaltenbrunner and many others, he would have been hanged or he would have poisoned himself. One of the things that's really surprising for me, because I didn't realize it at the time, and we were all told it's the German defendants at Nuremberg. Actually, there were quite a few Austrians. I mean, Arthur Seiss Inkvard was um, Horst's godfather, and Horst still sleeps with a photograph of Seiss Inkvart next to his bed, mm -hmm. which um, the psychoanalysts amongst you can <laughs> interpret away. It's, it's, it's really complex stuff at many different levels. Michael Ash? Yes, hello. Uh, Mitchell Ash is my name. I, I am a historian. And uh, your remark about keeping the emotions out of it touched me because in theory, we're supposed to do that too. <laughs> uh, we don't always succeed, as you surely know. Uh, but um, I have one point to what you have both have said about this amazing coincidence or non -co coincidence of descendants of the people you're thinking about living next door to one another. That's the first thing I want to talk about. And then I have a question for you, Esther, that's different from that. Um, the thing that seems to link the silences, I'm just get this is pure speculation, but it was it would to me the thing that links the silences is shame. Um, there's just shame of different origins, <laughs> but it's the same similar emotion, and you don't want to go there for obvious reasons. Nobody wants to go to a place to, where they might encounter shame. Um, it's just a guess, and I just wondered if you were And would you include amongst that the shame of survival, right. which I think Precisely. was one of the things my grandfather felt? That, that's what I'm getting at, exactly. Uh, uh, as opposed to the but shame the, of the, the descendants perpetrate. of the Nazis have a different kind of shame, yeah. but it's also shame. Uh, I just wondered what you thought of that. That was mm -hmm. the, the first thing, and the the the. Uh, but it, it goes beyond. I mean, it's, it's really spectacular cases you've been describing. Uh, are only part of the story. There are so many Viennese who um, live in houses that were Aryanized and who know that <laughs> um, to this very day. Um, this is one of the greatest acts of theft in human history, in fact, if you add it up. Uh, nobody likes to put it that way, but if you just add it up, mm -hmm. that's what you get. Um, so there's shame there too. It's just a different kind, again. There's shame there too, of a sort. 
uh, I think you mentioned it in your book, but if not someone else did in, in, in their book, that when the, some Jews came back to Vienna and visit, wanted, just wanted to visit their old apartments, <laughs> the people thought, oh, he, he, they're going to take the piano or they're going to take the apartment back. And if they didn't, they just wanted to see the apartment. Except for Charlotte Wächter. Right. <laughs> who came back <laughs> and through the Association of Concentration Camp Victims out of their former apartment so that she could return. Right. It's the reverse of the story. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you that, couldn't that, invent that it. Too. Right. Mm -hmm. Esther, my question for you, you said that uh, you, it was a marvelous, when you were 13, you were asked if you were Jewish and you just said spontaneously, yes. Um, but of course this opens a, a huge can of worms. Um, if I remember hearing it right, your mother is not, was not Jewish. So in, by some definitions, you aren't either, although you have a wonderful Jewish first name. Um, have you thought about these, that, that issue? Well, I didn't answer so easily. I thought there's, I always wish that there was something else between yes and no. And I thought to say no really would not be acceptable. And to say yes was the only alternative. And I didn't speak such good German, so I didn't have a huge amount, <laughs> feel I could have said. Um, so I, <laughs> I, I thought about it. And I said, yes, it felt like I owed it to say yes. So it wasn't, and I don't, I don't identify myself wholly as Jewish, but I do identify quite strongly with being a descendant of half my family as Jewish. And I think that's some plenty to, to identify with. Uh, I was at. I heard Amos Oz give a talk. Give a talk in Berlin many years ago, and someone stood up and asked him what he thought of the, up on this question, and the, the groaning was audible <laughs> in the audience because in Berlin it, this is a never-ending topic. He just smiled and said, um, "You know, you know, of course, that this question has been debated for hundreds of years by people who know much more about the theology and everything than I do. So I, I just have a simple opinion on it." He said. If you're crazy enough to want to be Jewish, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Entschuldigung, uh, vorher and sorry. And then. I'm Wolfgang Roth. I'm a group analyst. And by the way, I want to say that. Lemberg is closer to Vienna than Bregenz, which is a very interesting mm. thought. Uh, Bregenz is on the Bodensee. Mm. I want to, I was triggered what you said about Nicholas Frank and the problems of victim, victimhood. I want to share an experience which I had in a group where there was a woman. She was from Jewish descent and she was struggling and suffering her mother was taken to England as a child, as uh, saved, but she had a lot of problems being Jewish uh, in her history. And then suddenly in the group, a woman opened up and said her father was a high ranking Nazi and she lived in a Bavarian village. And then she started to tell how much she suffered because her father was a high-ranking Nazi. And I was shocked and I, I didn't think it is right. I, I had the feeling it's not fair. But then I had to realize there's also a victimhood from the perpetrators, which is a very heavy burden. And uh, this was a, a, an interesting experience for me. I must say I've been slightly freaked out even by the recognition of that reality. When I met Nicholas for the first time in 2011, it really was the first time I had asked myself the question, how does it feel to wake up every morning and know that you are the son of a man who has been hanged for the murder of four million human beings. Uh, it is just overwhelming. And I know too from speaking to 
Nicholas's wonderful daughter and to Horst's wonderful daughter, that it carries on. It doesn't stop with the child. I was deeply affected when Nicholas told me the story, which I recount in the book, on the day of the hanging of his father, the 16th of October, 1946, exactly 75 years ago, in a couple of weeks. He described how kids, he was seven years old, and kids would come up to him in the school playground and laugh at him because his dad was going to be hanged today for being a senior Nazi. So you're pushing at an open door. I mean, you know, I trust Nicholas and he's described that experience to me and there must be many who've gone through that. But equally, I think there are even more who've been through the experience of passing in silence where it is simply not known. I described earlier an experience I'd had, I'm not going to mention the name publicly, of working with a renowned international law professor, this was 25 years ago, from the University of Vienna, who I liked very much, who I respected very much, who was world famous. And then one day someone told me, oh, you know what he did in 1935 as a young lawyer? He was the Austrian who drafted the commentary to the Nuremberg Race Laws. And from that moment on, it was just impossible. I, I, I faced a situation where either I confront him and ask whether it's true and why he did it and all the questions one would want to ask, or I just can't speak to him anymore. And I was very young. I was a young academic. He was a, as a young academic. How do you ask a senior academic? And of course, that was what happened in Germany in 67, 68, but not in Austria. All of a sudden, students at law schools realized that their professors had all been senior Nazis. And the shock is what led to rioting in the law schools of Germany. It's been described to me now by some of my colleagues who were there and they told, and I didn't know anything about this. And so I think there is also that whole group. How do we deal with that reality, whether it's the appropriation of property or the continuation and elevation into jobs of high prestige, judges, ministers, law professors, the highest echelons of society, deeply implicated. I don't think the silence disappears. I think it continues. I think it haunts a society and a society that does not confront its past honestly and openly at some time will come to pay the price. I think we're facing that right now in the United Kingdom. We're facing it because it is a country that has not dealt with its colonial past, its slave inventing and owning past. It has tried to push it under the carpet. We learn all about how Great Britain was in ending slavery, but we're taught nothing at school about 200 years of engaging in slavery. So this is not a critique of any particular country or not. I think most countries go that way. And what's remarkable about Germany is I can't think of another country that has sought to engage with its past as Germany has done. And I'm sure, again, I speak not critically personally to anyone. It's the reason, frankly, that I am more comfortable walking in the streets of Berlin than I am walking in the streets of Vienna. Because Berlin has confronted the past. Vienna has not. Sorry, do I? Uh, Daniela, you have another question from the World Wide Yes, Web. just before we stop, there is also some question from the chat and maybe, Philip, because it's, you were talking about um, the silence, um, which is still ongoing, and the anonymous uh, comment is a question is, and I will read it for you. What is our generation silent about today towards our 30 years old children? So I just wanted to share this question with everybody in the audience. So was it a question? What is our? Yeah, but or, it's a question, but it's also 
a comment. Uh, yeah, something to think on. S something to think on. Yeah. Sometimes I it think. takes a long time to really yeah. be able to see something so clear that's right in front of you. And maybe we don't know that yet. Hopefully, maybe some of us do. I, I don't know. There will be things, there's no doubt. Well, I can give you a simple numerical answer. Charlotte and Otto Wächter produced 23 grandchildren. I am in contact with one. I think, yeah. I think that just speaks very, very loudly. Yeah, but you're sitting here speaking after your contact, being in contact with the one of 23. And you will have tomorrow the next event and the next discussion about all that. Well, no, I mean, I've been engaged in this so, for... And I think... Um, I've been engaged so, for 10 years and I've had, I've, had, I've had communications with some which have, I've been asked to keep private and I've respected that. And gist of the communications is of the line of please make sure your book is not published in Austria or could you please publicly forgive our grandfather before you publish your book that is the most strange uh, reaction Because it's interesting that we still need somebody who forgives us. So to see that forgiveness is not the point. The point is how will we live together in the future with all that what happened. And as Judith Butler said here for many years, it's not about forgiveness. And also your great grandfather said, it's not possible to forgive. Maybe it's not necessary to forgive. It's, um, it would be wonderful to find a way to stand it and um, live a good life together in the future. I, I want to come back on that point to what this lady said here. You know, at the end of the, I'm going to defend Horst Wächter. I don't like his views, but he has been incredibly generous and open with me and i feel i owe him a debt of gratitude and respect he has shared documents he has made available to the united states holocaust memorial museum all of those documents you can go on the web now and type in vechter archive u.s holocaust memorial museum and you can read them all they're all in german very difficult for me much easier for a lot of you i think that is a remarkable thing to have done. His line is, I don't have anything to hide. I make it all available. And he's done it. And he's paid a very big price with his own family for having done that. Now, I don't like his interpretation of the documents. I don't share his interpretations. But I honor and respect the fact that unlike pretty much anyone else, he's been open and allowed things to be discussed and debated. He is not a Holocaust denier. He is not a racist. He is not an anti-Semite. He is a little boy who is trying to find some way of living with the burden of a grandfather who was deeply involved and who was a mass murderer. And, and at the end of the day, I feel for him. I, I, I can't and I don't ever publicly attack him because I can't even be, we were talking about this, I can't even begin to imagine what it's like to have gone through what he has gone through. You know, it's a different kind of a burden. It's a different kind of a difficulty. And I'm trying to be as understanding as I can. It, sometimes it's very difficult and very frustrating. But I think those of us in the present generation can hold to account in the sense of dealing honestly with facts the successors of that ghastly group of people but they're not responsible 
their responsibility is to engage with what happened as honestly and as openly as possible but they're not responsible for what their parents or grandparents did that seems to me absolutely central thank you very much unfortunately time is um it's late and may i thank you all very much for coming and for the participation in our wonderful discussion and thank you very much for all the gifts you gave to us today thank you very much thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.